Tank Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Circling the planet Mars in an orbit of 3,000 DU's radius is Space Observatory Number 2, containing the largest and most powerful astronomical instruments in the solar system. Commander Corey's official flagship, the Terra 5, is now anchored to the main airlock. In the dome of the observatory, Buzz and Happy are conferring with the chief astronomer, Dr. William Dinsmore. Now, Commander, if you'll examine the charts there on the wall. Yes, Doctor. Those are charts of the radiation spectra of the sun. The first was made just four years ago. The others were made at six-month intervals. I don't get the significance, Dr. Dinsmore. It means that during the past four years, the sun has been pouring out increasing amounts of a new type of radiation. Is the radiation harmful? It may not be harmful in itself. But some scientists think it may be a symptom, a symptom of something wrong with the sun. Wow. Suppose something is wrong with the sun. What could the space patrol do about it? These radiations I mentioned, they've been detected from only one other source beside the sun. Where is that? From the star Kroganog on the rim of the uh, galaxy M31 half a million light years away. When were these radiations from Togonok discovered? About 25 years ago. They've increased in intensity during that time. Togonog, incidentally, appears to be similar to our sun in size, density, temperature, and light specter. Uh, at least it was. So what do you mean was? Remember, half Togonok is half a million light years away. Yes. We see Togonok as it was when the light left it half a million years ago. Actually, by now, it may have ceased to exist. I'm beginning to see why you sent me that space phone message, Dr. Dinsmore. If we could see Troganok as it is now, we might be able to predict the future of the sun. Exactly. The star drive. With the star drive ship, we could go to Troganok. Now, that's what I wanted to discuss. Even with the star drive, could you cover that vast distance? How long would it take in solar system time, I mean? I don't know. So far, we've made only one trip in it. A mere 50 light years to Valcor. After we got into star drive, the time spent in another dimension was only a few minutes. Mm. Troganog is 10,000 times as far away. A few minutes multiplied by 10,000 uh, might take weeks, a month. No, it doesn't work that way. The mathematics of hyperspace is entirely different. Chances are we could get to Troganog with star drive quicker than we could from Mars to Pluto under regular rocket drive. I only got one question. How soon do we blast off at Troganog? Commander, that's up to you. Perhaps there's some important problem or case you want finished first. Well, there's a crook named Gregory Baxson I've been trying to capture, but right now, Baxson doesn't seem important. It wouldn't take long to install the necessary detecting instruments in the star drive. I can leave the space observatory in charge of my assistant. Dr. Dinsmore, it takes a rugged constitution to take the shock of going in and out of star drive. If you've got instruments that'll record necessary information, Happy and I can handle it. Very well, Commander. Uh, perhaps you're right. Okay, Doctor. As soon as you get those instruments to Terra and aboard the Star Drive, we'll head for Troganok. Two days later, on the man-made planet Terra, Gregory Baxson paces the floor of his apartment. When the buzzer sounds, he takes a ray gun from his desk and strides to the door. Okay, Baxson, it's me. Come in. Well? What did you find out? There's not one word on Corey since he blasted off Baxson. I've been monitoring the Space Patrol space phone channels. Well, you can forget about Corey. We got another job to do. I just learned who the special agent is that Corey assigned to get me. His name is Davis, and he's right here on Terra. Uh-oh. That means we'd better go to a healthier planet. Not till we take care of Davis and destroy whatever evidence he's got on me. Well, look, Baxson, I don't like the idea of getting rough with one of Corey's men. Until we're sure Corey won't be around to even the score. Niblo, I'm telling you, Corey's gone for good. Didn't you install that gadget in his ship? Sure, but a lot of guys have thought they finished Corey. The criminal rehab centers are full of them. Will you quit worrying? This time it'll be permanent. Corey is in a time trap. What do you mean, time trap? <laughs> Maybe I'll tell you, Niblo. Maybe I will. After we knock off this special agent. Under constant acceleration of its rockets, the star drive ship is now far beyond the orbit of Pluto, outermost planet of the solar system. Carefully, Commander Corey checks the instrument panel, then turns to Happy. All right, Hap, cut rockets. We're going in the star drive. Are you okay? 
Okay, Happy. I'm a little dizzy from the silence, I guess. Well, we're in Star Drive. How long was I blacked out? I just pulled out of it myself a few seconds ago. Yeah, there's nothing to do but relax till we cut out of Star Drive. I wonder how accurate that hyperspace vector computer is over such a great distance. Suppose it plops us out into regular space several light years off course. Here's where we find out. Check those instruments Dr. Dinsmore gave us. Smoking rockets. Something went wrong, sir. Look, we're back in the solar system. There's the sun. If it is, we should recognize constellations of other stars. Orion, the Big Dipper, and so on. I'd say we were somewhere between the Earth orbit and Mars from the size of the sun. Hey, Commander. Look through the starboard viewport. Spiral nebula. You never see that from inside the solar system without a telescope. Then... Then that sun is... Really, Trogonok. We run some tests for the spectroscope and the thermocoupler and the other instruments. And we can compare the charts with those Dr. Dinsmore made of Trogonok at the Space Observatory. Well, that, that's either Trogonok or its twin brother. Everything checks, even to those radiations, except that they're weaker in comparison to the others. Well, then there's nothing to worry about. These strange radiations are dying down. And Trogonok is just the way it was half a million years ago. Apparently. Of course, it might have flared up and then subsided to normal. We'll go back into Star Drive and make a few spot checks at 100,000 light year intervals. Yeah. Then if the instruments indicate no change, we'll know for sure that the radiations don't mean anything dangerous. I'll adjust the hyperspace computer here. Commander, we don't know exactly where we'll come out of hyperspace this time, do we? I mean, we don't know what's between Trogonok and the next point of reappearance? No, that's true. Well, I know that space is relatively empty, and even the closest stars are millions of DUs apart, but... You're wondering if we'll reappear right in the middle of some blazing star, is that it? Yes, sir. The hyperspace computer has a safety factor, Hap. It's sensitive to any mass, whether solid like a planet or the dense gases of a star. We'll emerge at a safe distance from any object in space. That's a relief. It's set, Hap. I'm cutting in the star drive. Oh, Commander, what's wrong? Star drive won't take hold. It's broken down. Oh, can you fix it, sir? We can't. We're stranded. 500,000 light years from home. <laughs> new Star Drive spaceship, Buzz and Happy blasted off for Trogonok, a star half a million light years from the solar system. Previously, Gregory Baxson, a criminal wanted by the space patrol, had bribed an engineer, Niblo, to secretly install a device in the spaceship. Niblo himself doesn't know the nature of the device, but Baxson assures him that Buzz will never bother them again. The commander and Happy have just reached Trogonok and have made tests with instruments that prove the star is not emitting harmful radiations. When Buzz sets the controls for the return trip, the star drive fails to work. After checking the intricate mechanism, the commander shakes his head dubiously. Everything seems to check here in the control section, Hap. I can't find the trouble. Maybe Meyerhoff would know. He built the ship. If we could contact him by space uh, maybe... Uh, well, that's no good, is it? No. Even if he had a transmitter powerful enough to send the signal to the solar system... Yeah, I know. Uh, it'll take centuries to reach there. You've got to face it, Hap. This is the only star drive ship in the universe... No one can come and rescue us. We either fix a star drive ourselves or spend the rest of our lives circling Trogonok. Commander, look. It's a planet. Yes, fairly close. We were too interested in the star to notice it before. I wonder if there's life on it. A more basic question is, can it support life? Yeah. Yeah, if we find out it can, then we'll know for sure that those radiations from Trogonok were never harmful. Yes, but I wasn't thinking the radiations happened. There's a strong chance that this planet may be our home from now on. You, you think maybe you can't repair the star drive? I'm certainly going to try. But I, I know very little about this hyperspace principle. Remember, the man who designed this ship came from another solar system. Technically, far advanced over ours. I've been in some tough jams before, sir, but I, I never felt so completely lost. I know how you feel, Hap. Without the star drive, we couldn't get back to the solar system in a thousand lifetimes. 
We're not just trapped by distance, we're trapped by time itself. Hey, Commander, the view scope shows clouds on this planet. That means it's got an atmosphere. If it's breathable, we won't have to worry about an air supply, uh, no matter how long we're stranded. I can't be positive, but it looks as though there's water there, too. Commander, we've discovered a planet that gives us the right to name it. Let's see. What do we call it? Let's wait till we land and see what it's like. Slanting down through scattered clouds, the spaceship soars over the surface of the newfound planet. Buzz sets the ship down on a grassy field a few hundred yards from a wide, sandy beach. Immediately, he gets to work testing the circuits of the star drive mechanism while Happy makes instrument tests of the atmosphere. Well, the air out there is fit to breathe, sir. It's very similar to the Earth's atmosphere. More oxygen, though. Good. What's the temperature? 68. They won't need our spacesuits. I can hardly wait to get out there and explore. Have you seen any sign of life? Not yet. Outside of the plant life, I mean. If there is life on this planet, there should be some sign of it in the shallow water. Well, well, here's the trouble. What is it, sir? Something was tapped across one of the circuits. Something that caused this whole unit to burn out. Well, everything worked all right when we went into Star Drive and when we came out. The damage occurred when we tried to return to the solar system. Pat, whoever did this worked it out very carefully. He made sure we'd be stranded in regular three-dimensional space and with ordinary rocket power. But so far away, we could never trouble him again. Wow. What if he'd fixed it so the unit would burn out while we were in hyperspace? Would have been sealed up in nothingness forever. Our enemy couldn't be sure of that. If the circuits were broken down under star drive, we, you know, we might have emerged into regular space-time again, close to the solar system. Mm-hmm. I'd sure like to know who did this to us. Uh, not that we can ever pay him back. We won't give up, Hap. Let's go for a walk and explore our new planet. As we get a little sunshine and fresh air, we'll tackle our problem. For a couple of shipwrecked space patrollers, we didn't do so bad. Mm-hmm. Torganox planet has a nice climate. Yes, sir. But it looks like a storm out there over the ocean. And the wind's picking up. Now, look over there by the edge of the water. Hey, a seashell. Mm-hmm. There's some form of animal life on this planet. If we can find some live shellfish, we'll take them to the ship and test them to see if they're fit to eat. Hey, Commander. Look out there over the water. There's a black funnel-shaped cloud. Looks like it's coming this way, Hap. Come on, back to the ship. We don't want to be here when that tornado hits. Blasting off just ahead of the roaring tornado, Buzz takes the ship high above the surface of the planet. With infrared view scopes, they probe through the clouds, searching for a less stormy region of the new world. Oh, that storm sure whipped up in a hurry, Commander. It's almost as though it was deliberately chasing us off the planet. If that tornado was anything like the Venus or Earth variety, it would have twisted this ship into a mass of junk. Uh-oh, now what? Have check the air pressure indicator. Yes, sir. Hey, there's a leak in the hull. We must have been hit by a small meteor. And our meteor warning system is out of order. Well, what should we do? Drop down a few miles and equalize the pressure? Uh, maybe find a place to land. The way the pressure's dropping, we won't have time. Get two spacesuits out of the locker. I'll put the ship in automatic control and help you find the leak. After donning their spacesuits, Buzz and Happy discover a small hole in the hull of one of the compartments. After sealing it, Buzz takes the ship farther out in space and puts it in free fall around the planet. Opening the outer hatch, they crawl over the hull to seal the outside of the puncture. There. That patch ought to hold, Commander. If we're lucky. Bring the tools and we'll get back in the ship. Yes, sir. Well, I'd sure like to know what punctured our hull. It couldn't have been a meteor. No. There was something very strange about that hole. If I didn't know it was impossible, I'd say some of them... Hap, didn't you need the outer hatch open? Well, yes, sir. So all we'd have to do is slide down the hull and into the airlock. It's closed tight. Look. Why, well, it couldn't be. There's nobody in the ship. There is now. The fire rocket. Hang on, Hap. Commander. Stop us. Look off in the space. Drop flat on the hull. The friction may hold us. Yes, sir. Roll over on your back. Make your magnetic pole tight against the hull. It's not working. I'm sliding back toward the rocket blast. Take hold of my hand, Hap. Here. We stopped sliding. Now, if the ship doesn't accelerate anymore, we're okay. Who started those rocket engines? Maybe the automatic controls slipped back into place. I locked them off. Remember, the hatch was closed. While we were working in the hull, somebody's aboard our ship. But, Commander, before we blasted off from Terra, I searched it carefully. I, I, I feel like I'm going to float right off the ship. The ship's changing vector. We're going down toward the planet. If we crawl toward the nose, maybe we can look into the viewport and see who's at the controls. All right, Hap. I, I, I can't move. Of my space boats are stuck to the hull. The magnetic holding field is on. Whoever the pilot is, he wants to make sure we don't leave the ship. He's going to land. Let's 
Let's hope he has sense enough to take it slow when he hits the atmosphere. Yes, the air friction can tear and burn these spacesuits right off of him. In the long arc, the spaceship with its unknown pilot descends through the increasingly dense atmosphere of the planet. Down through the clouds it comes. Then lands gently on a grassy plain. When the rocket's cut out, Buzz and Happy find they can move. Sliding down the hole, they drop to the ground near the closed hatch and raise their helmet face pieces. Well, what now, sir? Do we open the hatch and go aboard? Well, we're sitting there may be armed, and we're not, so be careful. Commander, the hatch is opening. Hey, where did he come from? There is nothing to fear. I have no wish to harm you. Who are you? How did you get aboard our ship? I am Zara. And as you are surmising from my clothes, I am not of your solar system. Well, then where did you come from? I was already here on Kalona. I boarded your spacecraft while you were strolling along the beach. If you're from this planet, how does it happen you know our language? My race has advanced to the point where it can read the thoughts of other minds. Hey, like a living brainograph. From our few seconds of contact, I have been able to glean a great deal of information about you and the culture of your civilization. That hole in the ship, I suppose you did that. Yes. I regret the inconvenience it caused you, but it was necessary. I needed more time to examine your ship without interference. Well, that's a pretty high-handed attitude, Zara. Cadet, what would you have done if a strange spaceship had landed on one of your planets? He's got a point, Happy. So far, he seems to have taken care not to harm us. I was sent by our leaders to learn your purpose and intention toward Kalora. Now that I know you are on a peaceful scientific mission, you will not be molested farther. Thank you. We came here to test the radiation. Mars sun, which you call Trogonark. I can assure you that for more than three billion years, Trogonark has been a stable star. And it will continue to be so far into the future. How about our own sun? Being of the same size, type, and age, it will follow the same life cycle as Trogonar. I'm happy to tell you that you can return home with the good news. Yeah, I just wish we could. The star drive has broken his arm. Some evil person sabotaged your hyperspace mechanism, but it's in working order now. What? You mean you fixed it? Yes. Yours is a rather primitive form of star drive. Like all early models of any invention, it is unnecessarily complicated in certain respects. I took the liberty of repairing the damage, simplifying the unit considerably. Hey, that's wonderful. You've had star drive here in Kalora for a long time. For many centuries. Well, I'd sure like to see one of your ships. There are reasons why that can't be permitted at present. When you yourself have had contact with other cultures in various galaxies, you will understand. I am very sorry. That's all right, Tara. Anyway, now that you've been good enough to fix the star drive, we'd better be getting back to our solar system. I must warn you, Commander. When you return, be careful. What do you mean? While I was repairing the damaged unit, I was aware of a great sense of evil. You people in your stage of development do not know it. But you leave something of your personality upon everything that you touch. You mean you knew that star drive was deliberately tampered with even before you read our minds? Yes. In touching the melted parts, I sensed this evil force. Commander, does the name Niblo mean anything to you? Niblo. There's an engineer by that name who did some work on the ship. Then there is a secondary impression, rather faint, involving a name like Baxon. Baxon. Of course. Niblo must have done the work, and Baxon was behind him. Gee, Zara, we could sure use you in the space patrol. My talents are quite common here on Kalora. But in your civilization, they would probably cause more confusion than benefit. If you will excuse me, I'll return to my city. Must be some distance away. Can we take you there on the ship? Thank you, but it won't be necessary. This gravity belt will get me there in a few seconds. Gravity belt? Oh, that thing around your waist. Uh, how does it work? I just press the switch. Goodbye, gentlemen. Smoke and rockets, he's gone. Wow, would I like to have one of those gravity belts? Let's get started, Hap, into the ship. We're going home. 
ship blasts off from Kalora, constantly accelerating until the star Troganok is a small, bright dot of light. Anxiously, Buzz and Appy wait for their velocity to reach the safety margin before testing the star drive. Back on Terra, meantime, in Baxson's apartment, Baxson pockets a ray gun and thrusts another weapon toward his companion. Take it, Niblo. The special agent will probably try to put up a fight. I still think we ought to wait till we're sure Corey's finished. Well, I see. I'm going to have to tell you the whole story. Corey may be alive, but he'll never come back. That gadget you put in his ship was rigged to knock out the star drive after one complete cycle. You mean he can get in and out of star drive once, but he can't get back again? Yeah. And even if he went to the nearest star, he couldn't get back in a lifetime on a regular drive. Now, come on. Let's get to that agent's place and destroy the evidence against us. Hey, that was a great idea. Nobody will ever suspect that we had anything to do with Corey's disappearance. Hmm. Open the door, Nibla. You know, we... Corey! Uh, don't you stand there, Nibla. Get him, Happy. Hey, get him, sir. Hey. Hey. Gather up their weapons. Okay, Commander. On your feet, Baxson. Uh, Got off easy, considering what you did to our star drive. I don't know what you're talking about. Niblo did the work, but you put him up to it. Isn't that right? What's the use, Baxson? Yeah, Corey. Baxson hired me to do it. How did you find out I was behind it? It was simple. Nobody knew about it but Niblo and I. And I know Niblo didn't talk. Nobody knew about it. Why, it's all over creation. We heard about it from a fella on a planet a half a million light years away. Rumors sure get around, don't they, Commander? <laughs> Join us again next week for another thrilling adventure with Space Patrol. High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. Thank <laughs> you.